Hi, I'm Emma, she, her. And I'm Jess, she, her. And this is Fluff, the podcast about friendship, love, unfortunate failure and fun. <laughs> Emma is very excited to be with you podcast No, listeners. well I feel I'm working extra hard today because I'm suffering from allergies. I don't know if it's seasonal allergies, which seems so unfair because I'm not even outside, but I'm also horrifically allergic to my own beautiful cat, but that doesn't stop me from putting my face in her beautiful fur every day. <laughs> yeah, she gives the lovely comforts and we have got the the soundtrack of the flat, I would say, is Emma's poor sneezes. Yeah. But speaking of allergies to creatures, we are not here to talk about allergies to creatures, but the complete fascination yeah. of planet Earth's weird and wonderful creatures. Da -da -da! I mean, there are so many things on this planet that astound us when we're sort of looking at books or nature documentaries. And I think it's just incredible that we still don't even know. I mean, we're exploring space and we still haven't discovered all the creatures of yeah. the planet or the great depths of the ocean, for example. Yeah. So incredible. And I guess we were thinking about this topic a little bit more at the moment because we are filling our times, our evenings with binge watching all of the David Attenborough documentaries again. <laughs> yes, they're so fascinating and just they blow your mind. Like yeah. when watching nature documentaries, my heart rate is going fast. I am shocked. I'm gasping and my mind is blowing out of my ears. I just love the creatures of this earth so much. It just makes you realise when watching it just... We think of human race as very powerful, but look at the things that these creatures can do, the way that they've evolved and yeah. developed is amazing. And um, personally, I don't really see myself as a human being. I do like to think of myself as a weird and wonderful creature. Mm, I think you are one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I also think that watching these documentaries, it makes you realise that, yeah, we're more insignificant, but also we have such an impact with our carelessness. Yeah. Uh, David Attenborough's great at always bringing it back to, and here's the impact that humans have had on this creature. Yeah. And so we are going to talk about some creatures today. And I've researched, and Jess has done some research, and at least in mine, a lot of it, a lot of the closing statements in the research is, and here's how humans have sort of made it worse for this creature, or luckily this creature's yeah. okay from humans because of X, Y, Z. And not to be biased, but I suppose we can think of our humanity harming animals such as when you squish a fly which might feel for some people insignificant although i i genuinely can't do it i can't squish or stamp no, on any I can't. animal in fact there's a spider on the ceiling in this room that i pointed out to ingrid earlier and i said you get it <laughs> because i don't want it in my room but i couldn't do it no don't squish it no. it's a living breathing thing yeah but yeah so we might um you know not feel as guilty about stepping on a little fly or worm but if we are like making extinct from this planet or harming these ridiculously beautiful creatures then that is not something to be proud of we need to look after them and emma i've just realized apart from one tattoo two yeah. tattoos yeah all of mine are of weird and wonderful creatures yeah and i didn't realize you've got some beautiful um earthly animals on one arm and then yes. another lovely unicorn on the other all of yeah. your more human looking beings are actually creaturey beings yeah which is quite cool yeah to that i suppose i really do have a thing for them yeah mm -hmm. so we uh, of course have a little alcoholic tipple for us today yeah what is it jess um so this is the funky monkey and we have a, a short glass here mm. and I have got banana peel as a garnish just draping over. It's gone a bit dark now. But inside, Emma, do you want to take a sniff? Yeah. Does it smell boozy? Yeah, it doesn't actually smell that. Well, maybe a bit of the... I can't smell much, to be fair. My true. nose is very stuffed. But it's very... I'm obviously getting banana. I'm getting some peanut butter. Oh, it was the last spoonful of peanut butter. 
And also in here, you will find Kahlua, Wait. a coffee liqueur, Yum. and the classic vodka. So it has got fresh banana, peanut butter, crunchy, but it's been blended, and Kahlua and vodka, equal parts, we say, 25 mils per glass. And is it a smoothie? Is it an appetizer? Yeah, but it's just like, it's a nice little bit in the bottom. So, yeah, it's probably more filling than your average drink, but I don't think, I wouldn't call it a full smoothie. It's no meal replacement. I mean, I'm salivating to have a try. All right, all right, let's have it. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, I'm in love. I'm in true love. Wow. It's good. I mean, it's alcoholic. Yeah. <laughs> Which... Yeah. I didn't hold back. I think it's tasty. It's really... Do you know what? So Mm. this reminds me of when we used to go to the Caribbean and sort of rent a place to stay and make our own blender drinks. It's like a dirty banana, but with the Kahlua makes it a little bit more... Oh. It's kind of like, you know, when you get the double shots, like B52, the thicker double shots, it's a bit like that. Mm, I just don't want to stop drinking it. It's It's kind of a dessert... I could Meat have it for breakfast. breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, podcast listeners, I really recommend. But the thing is, I must let you know, we are obsessed with peanut butter. We just spoon it out of I the think, jar. I think more Jess than me. Mm. <laughs> I feel like I've never had so much peanut butter. I mean, I love it, but I've never had so much as I have had in the last four weeks living with Jessica. I am often caught... Or in, in, in any household that I've lived in, just spooning the peanut butter out the jar. Yeah. Weird and wonderful. Well. Yeah, excellent. Right, so in true fluff style, before we tell you about our amazing research, which is fantastically amazing this yeah. week. Yeah, um, and interactive for you today. And super interactive and funny. Um, we thought we'd t- share some of our animal stories. Yes. And particularly our weird and wonderful animal stories. So these aren't just going to be our stories of our cats and guinea pigs and dogs. Yes. These are the the wild ones that we've encountered. Yes. Yes. And I feel so lucky to have had um, a couple of of experiences with some truly awesome Mm. creatures and watching them in their natural lifestyle and routine. But I'd like to take you back, podcast listeners, to when I was younger and I think my fascination started... We had a little pond at our house and I used to, for entertainment, um, do nature documentaries and I loved it and I would always be presenting to my my TV audience. Um, But on this pond, we had amazing things such as the frogs and the frog spawn, but the pond skaters really got me, especially as they dance over the water. And I was bad though, but I used to pick the pond skaters out of the pond and then make them like talk to each other. Oh. I used to marry them. Oh. Should I be honest? Oh, yeah. Because I'm sorry, but young kids do this. I used to like make them kiss. Yeah. And I was so young, but I suppose this shows how early you can learn about stuff. Yeah. And I did used to like, you know. Bang them together. Bang them together. <laughs> I did it with Barbies. Slightly did, more yeah. conventional, but you know. The day my mum gave me a bed for my Barbies, I was like, don't need it. It's happening anyway. <laughs> the really flexible Barbies for being not <laughs> very flexible. <laughs> um, yeah, I grew up in Canada, so nature and weird and wonderful creatures are abundant. And the biggest that's in my particular area, because we do have, we've got beavers, we've got porcupines and skunks. You see those a lot. Mm. But the most wacky exciting one that i have i can say i've probably seen about 10 in my life wild not in a zoo yeah are bears and these are black bears so they eat oh. they're um, omnivores and they usually eat the berries that grow in the forest the berries the berries <laughs> yeah the bear <laughs> rookies um they and they have to like crazy facts about them and this is just from my memory of, of bear school. They have to, I think, double their weight in summer if as a female in order for their um, pregnancy to make it through winter. So they need to eat a lot of berries. They're massive yeah. creatures. And so on the years where the berries are bad, uh, because there's been a um, poor weather, they come out into public places. And those would be the years where I've seen them. And I remember yeah. the first time seeing the bear, I was probably five years old and my dad and I were making pancakes Mm. at my cottage and I was standing on the stool next to him and I looked at the window and said daddy there's a dog on my tire swing (gasps) 
And it was a bear pulling down the tire swing, like literally right outside the door. That was, was not the, swinging on the tire. It swing. wasn't swinging on it. It was just trying to climb it. And that was the same summer that we had a bear rip apart our metal shed um, oh to get gosh. into our rubbish. So they oh. are. They these ones are. They're not vicious. They're not looking to attack humans, but they are hungry and they need yeah. to feed themselves. And if they've got babies, stay far away. But oh. if you make noise around a black bear. So what we learn in school, make noise around a black bear and back away slowly and they are more afraid of you than you right. are of them. But with a grizzly bear, play dead because you're screwed. Basically. Oh my gosh. And they're huge. They're aren't massive they? grizzlies, yeah. Oh my gosh. I it reminds me of the film Homeward Bound and the film yes! where the big grizzly comes out, but I just wanted to see it. But you know what, Emma? Like, I suppose bears were fascinating for you mm. in Canada. And bears would be equally fascinating for me as a, a British person. <laughs> but when I went to visit Emma and her family in Canada, the thing that fascinated me beyond belief... Well, the only thing you saw, in fairness, we didn't come across the bear that trip, so... That is true, that is true. But I didn't need a bear because my breath was taken by the black squirrel. <laughs> Oh my gosh, is the black squirrel the most beautiful thing? It was snowing as well, so it was just like all of the snowdrops were just glistening off of its big bushy tail. But I've never seen a black squirrel. I'm used to the, the grey ones and they're a bit standard here. They're a little bit like a common rat or pigeon. Yeah. I love you, but the black squirrel, every single time I saw it, it was just like, oh my god. Yeah. Uh, so Jess was visiting my family and this was Christmas. And um, and it's funny because she wasn't the first British person to visit and suddenly freak out about a squirrel. And we just, I mean, they're a bit mundane to us. Um, they're like the grey squirrels. <laughs> we see them squirrel. as much grey, black, red squirrels you see less frequently, but mm. they're nasty. They tend to sort of burrow into your houses and eat bits of your siding and stuff. So Ooh. we're not like massive fans of squirrels. And I always remember my dad being like, it's like, it's like they're cats because you kept running from window to window to look at the squirrels. It was. It was so. It was the highlight of the day, yeah. really. So, well, no, <laughs> the highlights of the day was when Emma's dad would pull out the the vegan babies. Oh yeah, for coffee in the morning. <laughs> it was Christmas. <laughs> Maybe that's why the squirrels were extra yeah, amazing. Extra exciting. <laughs> the seven a.m. coffee had some substance in it. Yeah. So, I suppose also when I realised that really creatures really get me deep in my heart as well was comparing my reactions to others and one time my ex had um this is when we were not living together yet but lesbian relationships move quick so it's probably the first week <laughs> <laughs> and um she messaged me saying oh my gosh there's loads and loads of ladybirds on my windowsill in my room which we call ladybugs ladybugs yes and I said, oh my gosh, how amazing. You are so lucky to be visited by them. And she was completely freaking out. And I went over and it was like watching magic happen. I was so fascinated and I was delighted that they were in the room. There was about 50, 60 ladybugs, maybe more. Do you know what's the funniest thing about recording this podcast? We plan, we sort of independently plan our anecdotes in advance. But every time, without fail, we help each other to remember things that we haven't thought of. So I was just remembered that we at the cottage used to have, um, like, every summer is marked by a different infestation. And we had the summer of the ladybugs. And yeah. literally, you could fill your hoover oh my God. with ladybugs oh my inside. God. It was quite problematic. And then we had the summer of the earworms or, yeah. or earbugs. We call them ear. Earwigs. 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 Sorry, I just said that all wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they with their little pincers, they were everywhere. Yeah. Um, so... And they smell. Have you ever... Like, oh, they're horrible. They, and they if you kill them, smell. they're horrible. Yeah, they have a real funky smell to them. Yeah, that might have been the only time where I felt like I was immune to them. Yeah. Can I tell you another crazy insect story? Yes, please. I love so, the insects. I thought Canada had wild animals, and then I went to Australia. Oh, my God, yes. Every, I mean, of the... 10 most deadly creatures i think seven live in australia so and they're big it's like take everything from everywhere else in the world and then multiply it by a hundred in size mm. and that's what they all look like um and this applies to their spiders so i was in australia oh it must have been five four years ago now um for my brother's wedding 
Um, and we were staying at my sister-in-law's parents' place, and they live in the middle of the rainforest in this beautiful cabin. And they'd all gone away for a few days and left me and my partner, my sister and her husband to sort of look after the property. But we are not well versed in creature management. Yes. Um, And I was having a bath in this beautiful bathtub overlooking this beautiful view. It's over a mountain and then you can see the sea in the distance. It was stunning. And I was getting out of the tub and my ex says to me, whatever you do, just don't look up. (laughs) obviously what do I do look up there is a spider above my head that is possibly bigger than my hand uh and we it didn't this is attached to our room where we're staying and so I obviously freak out I mean we'd already seen loads of little little lizards in this room and we kind of knew stories of crazy snakes in the past etc but I just hadn't thought about the spiders so we got my brother-in-law involved and he pierced it with a fire poker trying to kill it which you know but I didn't I didn't want to carry it so it was like bigger than a tarantula um and it survived that and then went crazy and was running around the room and up the walls and everything um and then finally we managed to knock it one more time and get it outside and it was terrifying I and I thought that I wouldn't be a person that would scream in that scenario I was standing on a chair. (laughs) Yeah. But that could be a daily experience of... Oh, definitely. My sister-in-law is, for being someone who lives in a city, is very fashionable, is very like, you would never guess this about her. She's very much like, oh yeah, there was a python above my bed when I was a kid, or here's a snake skin, I'll just chuck it outside, or blah, blah, blah. Because this is where she grew up. Yeah. And I lived in Thailand in 2015. Mm. And... um, that is when I got used to lots of different... Cre- I always, I never really had a problem with anything. I am somebody who's like, yeah, let me hold the scorpion. <laughs> but it is one of the most... It will be, till the end of time, the best one of the best things that I've ever experienced. And it is called a bat crossing. And I was in northeast Thailand. And I met somebody who just said, I'll show you the bat. And we were just in the wilderness. It was perfect and we went to a cave and we went inside the cave and the person who was showing me around um, was pointing at all the different bats and would say and three two one fly and then that bat (gasps) would fly and then he'd point over to another bat in a different direction say and three two one fly because bats have the same pattern every single day wow and then we went outside the cave and the sun was setting And when the sunset had got to almost darkness, when it had almost gone, then millions of bats just vroom, came out of the cave and just flew over our heads. And it takes a long time. But all of these bats were just flying out and that's when they go and feed and then come back. And I just stood under this bat crossing, (laughs) just going, oh my gosh, what is life right now? I am so grateful for this experience. But wow, these are animals and they're doing this just like humans don't even know what they're doing, but they've got themselves sorted. You've just reminded me of another bat story, but again, another animal in a domestic setting, which is scary for them and scary for you. We've had a few occasions of bats in the house, in my old house with my parents. And there's this one occasion where because they follow the light or they fly towards the light, we thought we were being strategic because it was in one part of the house, turned all the lights out and then just left like a light by the door and sort of expected it to go out. I remember my dad being like, all right, let's go to bed. And my mum being like, you're going to bed? We can't do anything. It was hidden up amongst like the rafters so we couldn't reach it or anything. Yeah. Um, but I was up late reading a Harry Potter book um, with my just my night lamp. And this was very far away from where this bat was. But of course, because I left my door open a crack for my cat to get in, that light had it had somehow found the light to my bedroom and came flying in. Oh. It was flying circuits in my bedroom. And of course, I freaked out. I managed to lock it in my room and went and got my parents... I must have been like 13 or something and my sister was home and my dad came in his silk bathroom with an oven mitt and a spoon Good luck, with his Peter. like attempt to cat because we didn't want to kill it we wanted to get it outside so yeah. somehow a Tupperware got involved and we were holding towels over our heads it was wild yeah we did manage to get it out but it's pretty scary and they make 
really, really loud screechy sounds if they're, mm. in, if they're afraid. So mm. I just feel bad for creatures when they get stuck in homes. Yeah, if you can, put a glass over, put a Tupperware over. But that's and just the hard part. You have to get them into the glass and the Tupperware. I suppose I know being five foot two millimetres. That's right, five foot two millimetres. <laughs> um, sometimes it can be hard to reach. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We got a top up of our funky monkeys. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> they uh, they're really funky and they go down quick. It's really, it's really delicious, nice. podcast listeners. Mm. Do recommend if you want. And of course, recommend. in general, if you don't want the alcohol content, just banana it's and a, peanut butter. It's a nice smoothie, and I think it's nice because we're just having a little bit, so it could be heavy, but it's it's just lovely. So I have one last um, story to tell you about one last or a couple of last weird and wonderful creatures again in the land down under with um, in Australia with one of my bestest friends from high school, Melissa. Uh, we were on a school trip and we were in the rainforest way up north, um, north of Cairns by a few hours drive for a really long time I feel like in my memory it's like a whole week I don't think it maybe was that long but there was a lot of free time in this part of the Mm. trip whereas the rest had been like you know a school trip very scheduled activity based whereas we were living in this sort of nature reserve in these huts and you could do what you want with your days and there were just a few fixed things so Melissa and I took some bikes and decided to go on a a cycle ride in fact we cycled to a, a crocodile cruise to see some crocodiles but it was a rainforest and it was wet season, so we were cycling and we were cycling through really sort of rivers that um, went over the road or had overflowed over the road. Um, and we were cycling kind of all day long. And at one point we stopped and we saw these amazing, they look like ostrich birds with hmm. blue, dark blue heads, very, very tall, massive. And we went, stopped, looked, talked about it, we're like, oh, aren't they amazing, blah, blah, blah. I think we're 16 at this time. And then we cycled back to the resort and we were telling everyone about what we saw. And the guide was like, oh my God, first of all, you shouldn't cycle through rivers because that's where crocodiles will just be waiting. (gasps) Second of all, cassowaries, which is the big bird we saw, are like known as the world's most vicious bird. If they encounter a human, they will attack. Are you kidding? And they have been known to be fatal. And us, we're just these two 16-year-olds we're just there being like, oh! <laughs> I love the phrase, have been known to be. Exactly. It's just like, what the fuck were you doing? This could happen. Exactly. <laughs> we didn't know. And I, to be fair, I feel like we should have been warned of those things before they let us take bikes off of the reserve. But I mean, I really want to see one. I love anything with a blue head. Yeah, they're gorgeous. I'll show you a picture in a moment. Amazing. Speaking of pictures and drawing up some fun and funky animals, podcast listeners, it is time to get interactive between us. That's right. We have each researched some incredible animals. And when we say the name of each animal, if you have another electronic device with you or you can do it whilst listening to us, please do type that into Google Images and see what comes up. And we are going to ask you, podcast listeners, what is the first word that comes to your head? Yeah. Okay, let's see what you think of these creatures. Particularly as well, because I think we picked a lot of these creatures because of their wacky looks as much as their wacky, um, interesting stories Mm. behind them. And not to go all queer, but to go all queer. Yeah. Um, in terms of having a you queer are all identity, queer, yeah, I am so. all queer. This is another fascination with weird and wonderful creatures because people always say to both Emma and I, like, we love your costumes, and we're like, it's <laughs> it's our normal clothing. <laughs> yes. So, Emma, would you like to start? Of oh, course. Me? Yeah. Okay. So your first weird and wonderful creature today, Jess. Yes. is called, and podcast listeners, is called the Red Lip Batfish. The Red Lip Batfish. I'm yeah. typing into Google Images. I'm pressing enter. And, oh my word. Yeah. Like Do you see Human them lips. Big old red lips. They are like, get me onto the burlesque stage, please. Gorgeous. Uh, Yeah, these stunning creatures have a long and sharp nose and they look like they've put on a lot of red lipstick. Yeah, that is like, pow. 
Yeah, so that's obviously why we picked this one. We knew that lipstick would go far with Jess. I love uh, <laughs> but some scientists believe, or scientists don't actually understand why they have these red lips, but they might believe it's to do with the male attracting a female for mating. And I love that it's the man that's wearing the lipstick, yes. the man, the male creature that has the lipstick in this scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, what's interesting from this strange sea creature is that unlike any other fishes, get this, this is the weirdest fact about them, they're horrible swimmers. They can't they can't really swim. They oh. crawl on the ocean floor, but they're fish. Unlike other fish which swim, they're not like a crab that they crawl on the ocean of floor. Of course they have their fins are like Yeah. Walking like exactly. Legs. So they move with their fins along the floor. <gasps> they are found in the Galapagos Islands. Nice. And they have a built in fishing rod snout with a rectangle appendage. Love that word. In order to lure in their prey. I was going to say that is quite yeah. the snout. Yeah, they're carnivores. So they, they feed oh. on small invertebrae and crabs. It reminds me of like the elephant seal, that big yeah. extended snout. A big front on it. So, but the other thing is there's not much information about these creatures. Scientists oh. are still trying to observe about the function of its bright red lips. They still don't, as I said before, know why that's there. Um, But the good news, and this is lovely news for our creatures on our list, is that they have no threats and they are very far from being at risk. Amazing. They think maybe that's because they can walk on the seafloor, so they're really hard to find. Yeah, and they seem like they could, apart from those bright red lips, could camouflage quite well. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they have got quite sad lips, though. They're like like upturned clown red lips. They're not like... They're not going to the club. They're about to perform a clown show. Yeah. <laughs> Although I would happily go to a club with them. Of course. Jess, what's your first creature? Okay. I'll type it in. All right, ready to type it in? So I would like to start with, please, the leaf-tailed gecko. Leaf-tailed Spelled- gecko. G-H-E-C-K-O. What do you think, podcast listeners and Emma Barr? Mm-hmm. Oh... Yeah, I mean, it's a leaf. It is. It's essentially a leaf, but a gecko. And essentially, they're actually um, camouflaged to be a dead leaf, so a very unappealing leaf. And they only emerge at night, and they live in Madagascar. Mm. And so, yes, these geckos, they feed on almost anything, and they love crickets, flies, spiders, cockroaches, snails... But they are also at high risk of... <coughs> and that, that is sneeze. the truthful situation of what we are in. <laughs> Bless you. Salute. Um, but yes, they are quite um, enjoyable by birds, snakes and rats. So they do need this leaf-like imitation of a dead leaf. So they can dissolve easily into bark and things Aww. like this. But what I would also like to share, out of all geckos... The leaf-tailed gecko is one of the most fantastic. In fact, they say top of it because they say that over... (laughs) There's a ranking of geckos. Yeah, there's a ranking of geckos. And it's about how they have evolved Ah. um, through time to adapt to their environment. And the leaf-tailed gecko has basically nailed it. They've basically become their environment. They have become the exact same environment. Wow. Um, I always wonder about things that camouflage so well. Is it lonely and do you lose your friends? Oh. Because I can't see you. Of course. <laughs> and like there's lots of different images because some of them have different colours. So yeah. you do have a check. But do you know what makes me laugh as well? When I did my fact finding, it was saying about it was saying about an animal that is of the mouse family in Australia. And the males, um, not being lonely, have so much sex that they blind. <laughs> so much sex that they go blind and die. <laughs> so he's not evolving with the times, but the leaf-tailed gecko has it down. Wow! Give it up for the leaf-tailed gecko. I love that. Halloween outfits are plenty, everybody. Just get a lot of leaves. Yes, so you can say, I'm just covered in geckos. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my next creature is actually quite sort of common for me i mean i've actually seen one in real life Mm. but i what i learned about them actually was the most interesting of all of them so this is called get your phones out the star nosed mole oh my gosh i love them all moles are beautiful so i know i know 
Whoa. Ding dong. I've only ever seen a dead one because my cat used to attack these, bring them home for us. I mean, they all look a little bit dead. They basically look like a mole with, instead of a head, like a starfish on it. It looks like something out of Stranger Things. Yeah, exactly. So, but that head is incredible. So let me tell you a little about it. It's the world world's fastest eater and it can gobble down an insect (gasps) or a worm in a quarter of a second. So that's... Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Less than that, maybe. <laughs> um, the mole hunts. This mole ha- hunts by bopping its star. I like the word bopping in this paper. Um, against the soil as quickly as possible. And it can touch 10 or 12 different places in a single second with this little face hand wow. star. It looks random, but it's not. Um, with each touch, 100,000 nerve fibers send information to the mole's brain. That's five times more touch sensors than in the human hand, all packed into the small nose, smaller than a fingertip. <gasps> is that crazy? And then the other thing that I think is, this is this one actually sort of blew my mind. Um, the giant star pattern uh, on the mole's nose is imprinted into the brain as well. So inside the brain, you can see the same pattern. So it is because it doesn't need to see underground it just needs this this incredible sense of touch it can tell it's like its eyes so if one part of the star touches that part of the brain will light up and it knows which way to go so cool oh my gosh i am kind of half gagging yeah and half want to get it tattooed on my body yeah, I think there's, I mean, there's more. This is the one that had the most stuff. It's one of two animals in the world that can smell underwater Brilliant. because it blows bubbles and then sucks it back up. Mm. And this is, uh, it, it does apply to humans. It's such an interesting animal to study because the sense of touch is the one that we know the least about. And because they have this such heightened sense of touch, um, it could reveal clues about how touch works at a molecular level, which would help us with things like pain for example which is a touch feeling Mm -hmm. um so cool i love this one i agree i'm just thinking of how it would feel to be touched by the The star by the star of the mall it looks like the baby ones are quite cute i'm sure they are and in fact when i've seen them you barely see the face so, like, I'm imagining when my cat Jeremy would leave it on the front door, it would be cur- like it just, if you saw it from above moving in the grass, it would just look like a mouse without a head, but you wouldn't see the star because that would be down on the ground because they don't look up because they don't need to. Freaky, but I like it. Yeah, exactly. And the way you like it. It's the way I like it, baby. So, I, okay, on that strand then, I'm also going to give you a next one, which is part of a family that we all know. But just a little bit different from your average turtle. Please type in podcast listeners and Emma Barr. The Eastern Long-Necked Turtle. The Eastern Long-Necked Turtle from Australia with a neck that is the length of about 30 centimetres, one foot. Look at that neck popping on out. Now, (laughs) I'm obsessed with turtles and I'll tell you why after this, but I'm not going to upstage the eastern long-necked turtle um so bless it they're known as the stinkers apparently they're super pungent when they're stressed they spray out for longer than a meter this um particularly pungent smelling scent and in Australia, they can often be found on the road. So they say that if you're trying to get one to safety, oh, you need to touch it. Yeah, or like protect yourself yeah. to get it out the road. Does it come out of their pores or like out their bum? I think it comes out of their mouth. Oh! But going queer and everything, um, also it's impossible to tell the sex of a baby eastern long necked turtle, aka also snake necked turtle, until they're about six or seven years old. Um, you're not able to tell what um, sex it is. But they're very similar to a snake, they say, because they can use that long neck to kind of snake around and then wrap around their oh. prey. So that is the purpose of this amazing... Oh, yeah. I was going to say, it looks like a snake and a turtle in one. Yeah, and it has kind of both those things. It likes to eat the things that snakes eat, such as frogs, fish. Um, but it does live in rivers and ponds. Mm. Um they are under threat, unfortunately. And that is because rivers and any water spaces are now, of course, so polluted with rubbish. So they are affected by that and they are decreasing. 
Um, so we do need to look after our lovely little um, Eastern long necked turtles. But can I tell you a really quick story about turtles? I have got a turtle yeah. tattooed on me. So uh, this was when I spent some time uh, backpacking and I was in Malaysia. And I just met a wonderful guy um, who lived where I um, was staying and he was a scuba diving instructor and he took me scuba diving. And when you come out of the water for scuba diving, you have to move very slowly so that your brain has time to readjust mm, to the to pressure. Because sure. you maybe you've gone scuba diving very deep in the ocean and you must slowly come up. And I had yet to see a turtle on my scuba diving adventures and really, really, really wanted to see one. And we saw one and it was huge. I was not prepared for the size of this turtle. And because of the shock, I did like a... <gasps> and I... Boop! I shot to the top of the ocean. And wow. I thought my brain was about to explode and my friend was Aww. trying to grab me. Luckily, I survived. Um, but it was just that amazing it was huge how big would you say it felt like looking at you know one of those huge tortoises that you get on yeah. land it yeah. looked like that to me it was so and he said that was an old one like it was a amazing. biggie and i was expecting something much more medium sized <laughs> it, it blew my mind oh emma can we have another one please speaking of your queer creature I'm gonna bring you to another one that has um an interesting relationship with its own sex um which is the dumbo octopus the dumbo octopus refers to <gasps> <laughs> one species but an entire genus of sea deep sea umbrella octopuses so it's not just one type it looks like at. a little Pokemon character. Yeah. So obviously it got its name from Disney because of the fins on the side that look a little bit like Dumbo's ears. And that's actually how it travels around. Oh. So they move slowly, flapping their ear like fins. Instead of, we always imagine they're doing it from their tentacles, but it's these fins that sort of guide them a bit like a rudder around. They're really sort of round and plump kind of creatures. They're cute. But what's interesting about Dumbo octopuses is that they live in the open ocean in the deep, deep sea at least 13,100 feet Yikes. below the surface, um, making them the deepest living of all known octopuses. I really like them. They're yeah. They're very cute. But what's interesting is because they live out in the open, open ocean um, they're, and they're naturally rare... And the oceans are so enormous. These species have specialized behaviors to increase the likelihood that they can successfully reproduce any time they find a mate. So females can apparently carry their eggs in different stages of development, not just at the beginning, and are able to store sperm for really, really long times after uh, mating with a male so that they can sort of use it advantageously and drop their eggs off whenever they're in a good place for, for leaving their babies. Right. So it's not just about I, there's this place we go and there's this immediate encounter. It's like they, they can manipulate the reproductive systems to work to their favour, which is really cool. I love that. Yeah. They're cute. They are. Emma. Yeah. And podcast listeners, the final one for you, please. If you could type into Google Images, the living rock. The Living Rock. Ah, there we go. Images. Oh. Yeah. You may... What even is that? It is, Emma and podcast listeners, not a rock. It is an animal. It really is. Um, All these pictures are of it cut in half. Does that mean someone's cut an animal? I feel... Well, yeah. Which is strange concept because I suppose they're looking inside of it like you would... A rock with crystals mm, in it or something. Yeah. But this is ridiculous. And it is born male, but at puberty, it can have um, both sperm and eggs reproduced within it. And it, the reason that it releases sperm and eggs is because if you can't find another, if it can't find another living rock, then it will mate with itself. Love it. I love it. Yeah. I love it. But it actually is also a delicacy because it is found off the coast of Chile and Peru in South America. 
um, and so locals will catch it and eat it raw or in stews and uh, they say that if you taste it it maybe has a slightly bitter or soapy taste amazing i love the idea of a living rock and especially like all oh, powerful because who needs a partner just yes. have fun with yourself <laughs> and i would just like to say if anybody debates against a spectrum of gender identities and sexual orientations look to the creature kingdom indeed they're all at it yeah all, like evolving somewhere. they're all on that spectrum somewhere and there's different roles and different types of creatures mm. it's incredible what's out there in nature and we should people, take more time to listen to nature. Absolutely. And some people can say, oh, but look, the, the male lion will always be the top. But that is not the case for so many other creatures. But they're not really. Like the male lion is in the top in terms of mating. But the females are the ones who bring in the food. And there's more females than there are males. And yeah. they're stronger. And they're going to be the ones that attack you. So Breaking the binary through exactly, weird and wonderful creatures. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so to finish off or wind us down, I have prepared for Jessica a, it's not even really, it's not a quiz, it's a challenge um, of a, an animal sound challenge. So I have come across um, five animals that make the craziest, most unexpected noises, and I'm going to give Jess a description of the animal and then ask her to try and mimic the noise. And then we'll play the real sounds. I'm so excited. The first animal on my list is da -da -da -da, the the cheetah. What sound do you think a cheetah makes? Uh, so super fast. Uh, but oh. Gorgeous. That was actually quite good. I That's mean, it. I don't know if it sounds like a cheetah, but it was nice. But let's find out. So here's the cheetah. It sounds very similar to what I did, but I didn't sound like I was giving birth as much. Yeah, this is very like, uh, like a bit yeah. whiny. So that's cheetahs in a face-off. They're fighting each other there. Oh, they sound a little bit like toddlers having a tantrum. Yeah, didn't expect that one. Wow. I think that was the one that possibly blew my mind the most, but they're all quite wild. So Jess, yeah. are you ready? Oh, she's got her finger in her cocktail, licking up all the yummy remains of that funky monkey. Um, your next animal, Jessica. And you can try this too, podcasters. See if you, uh, see if you can make it work. Please do. Your next animal is a possum. Oh no. Do you want to um, see? This is what it looks like. Yeah. So look it up if you, that helps you, a visual. I suppose maybe it's like. Okay. We're going squirrely a little bit. Small is rodent like. Everyone, this is what a possum sounds like. Oh, oh it's a bit snorty. And like. Uh, I don't even know if we can do that. Yes, I suppose it looks small and cute, which I like to think sometimes I'm five foot two, as I've said, and I don't think people expect the deep sounding husky voice to come out my mouth sometimes. No, well, it's a lovely voice. It's a very attractive voice, I'd say. That's you can let us know, podcasters, if you oh, like her voice. please. I can do the most. <laughs> Your next sound to make, Jessica, is the sound of a, this is going to be a hard one, sound of a piranha. Okay. Well, it's underwater. Exactly. So we have no context for this, really. So maybe its gills are going like... Oh, you're doing so well. Excellent work. All right, let's hear what a, pod, uh, a piranha really sounds like. That's what they do. What is that? So it's electric. So it's like electric sparks. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Let's hear one more time the beginning one. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's like a little uh, a woof woof, woof in a way. Yeah. It was unexpected because you don't sort of think of fish as making sound. No. And even you went for the sound of the gills, which is more environmental sound than the sound they might make from their mouths. Yeah. 
wild. So they've got like vocal cords making sound. Yeah, or something is resonating. <laughs> okay, back to Australia for this next animal. Uh, Jessica, what does a koala sound like? Oh... I imagine they're maybe like the fox a little bit that look cute and fluffy, but actually maybe when they're mating, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and your face to go along that with, <laughs> you assumed the position of a koala and then made the sounds. Excellent work. <laughs> Five stars for me, but here is an actual koala. Stop it. blown my mind that one was probably possibly the most shocking i agree and i think that brings us to the end of our quiz for today i loved that and i loved it i loved that so much (laughs) it was fun and what i like is that actually you gave really convincing animal sounds and i would cast you as those roles oh my gosh please put me playing a piranha right now jessica playing piranha (laughs) (laughs) And Emma, you can be the living rock. Oh, thank you. Spouting out sperm and eggs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so podcast listeners, how did you find this episode today? Did you enjoy hearing about the weird and wonderful? Do you have stories of encountering the weird and wonderful? Or reading about weird and wonderful where you're like, ha, you think the living rock is cool? Wait until you hear about this. Tell us. Yeah, if you are someone who works with animals, who does this as their job, we'd be so interested to hear from you about your experiences, but also we're equally interested in hearing about people who also found squirrels quite interesting. Yes, please do. And just to recommend also to look up the Edge Project, which is a collaboration between London Zoo and Whipsnade Zoo. But the Edge Project um, works to... Um, support all of the animals and creatures which are extremely endangered and you don't hear about as much such as the rhino for example so there are 572 on their list go and check them out i actually know about them because a friend from school works for them but please go and look at them and they've got excellent resources as well on their Mm. website if you want some fun to do during quarantine and if you are not in London and still want to learn a little bit about animals or find a way that you can give support, look up your local animal charities. There'll be different ones in different countries um, for whatever animals are in your area. But I guarantee that even in your domesticated places, there are animals that need your love and support. So try and find them and then just get down and dirty with them. Absolutely. And remember what we've said as well each and every creature has a function so let's use that also not to judge human beings yeah we each are built in a way that serves us and gets us through we are living and breathing as ourselves so the same way we respect animals respect humans exactly peace out there's that so if you want to get in touch with us about any of your research or any of your stories you can find us on instagram or twitter we are at fluff creatives or you can email us at fluffinquiries at gmail.com have a great week cheerio thanks for listening and don't forget to rate and subscribe we're excited to welcome you into our fluff family and bring you some gorgeous sparkles every friday (laughs) 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 